Um, I'd like to, you know, really uh, thank them for inviting me, having me uh, at this, this great event. And I hope to see more events like this. I was talking to my friend Atif Mumtaz, who's a speaker here. Uh, later, he'll be speaking. And the fact that there's so many uh, young people that are so brilliant, it's a real um, tribute to where Pakistan is going. And I know in the news, a lot of people talk about how there's problems in Pakistan and this is going bad, that's going bad. But there are so many brilliant, wonderful young people who can change the future of Pakistan. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's been very inspiring to me. You know, I, I could live anywhere that I want to in the world. I, I could live in Antarctica if I wanted to. I could live, you know, of course, back in my home country in the States. But when I came here to do relief work after the earthquake five years ago in Pakistan, something about this country really took my heart. Um, the children here were uh, very broken and very uh, damaged and injured from the earthquake, the children that I saw. And out of all the dis disaster relief efforts that I've done, uh, it was the most uh, intense and the most uh, injury and, and death and destruction that I'd seen uh, out of any of the disasters. So uh, I think that that really kind of took my heart. Uh, and I wanted to do something for these children that survived and have kind of made Pakistan my second home and have spent the, in the last five years more than half the time here. Of course, I go back in the States and I do fundraising so that I can continue my, my efforts here. But I'll go through some slides real quick to show you my organizations. One is registered in Pakistan under the Societies Act. It's called Comprehensive Disaster Response Services. We, uh, it's CDRS. We registered CDRS in uh, 2006, just a few months after the earthquake. And then uh, a group of Pakistani American doctors and philanthropists from the, uh, uh, from the Los Angeles, California area uh, have been supporting me since that time. And we recently registered in the United States as Shine Humanity. And uh, we've just opened up an office uh, here. Most of the time we've been up in Azad Kashmir uh, where our projects are. But since the flooding, we have been expanding our services and we have an office now in Islamabad, which we've just opened. This is me as a musician. Uh, for many, many years, that's what I did um, to make a living. And never thought I would do disaster relief work. Never thought that I had the aptitude to do disaster relief work. But 9-11 uh, happened. And I was in New York City. Uh, to play a performance that was scheduled for the 12th of September. And uh, so my life was just as a musician, playing music, playing performances, going here, going there. Um, I did do a lot of work to help troubled teenagers who were doing drugs and things. Because when I was a teenager, I lost my mother. She died when I was 12 years old. And I went down the wrong road and started hanging out with a bad crowd and getting into very heavy drug use. Music saved me from that. And so what I did in my life as a musician before 9-11 was play music, both commercially and playing at places like jails and, and troubled teen uh, centers and uh, reform schools and, and regular schools. Talking to kids about drug use and playing music. And that's what I thought I would probably do with my life. Um, but then this disaster of 9-11 happened. And it kind of makes sense to me because uh, I think the reason that I've ended up being good at disaster relief work is because my life has been a disaster, you could say. Um, but when it has been a disaster, when you've had your own disasters, then you, of course you can have more compassion for people who are going through disaster and you can do something for them. So when 9-11 happened, I put my guitar down and I decided to assist with the efforts to heal from that terrible tragedy. Uh, I ended up 
getting supplies from different pharmacies and stores, whether it was um, medicines or clothing or supplies, and gave it to the people that were there working in that area. I stayed for about a week, and then what I was doing there wasn't needed anymore because what I was doing was able to get a small amount of supplies, but things that were needed very quickly. While the larger efforts were still taking shape, while bigger supplies and bigger things were coming in, uh, there was about a three-day period where there was a lot of chaos. And it was during that time that I was able to be valuable in getting things in small amounts to people who needed them right away. So after that, it was uh, a new discovery, uh, an ability that I really didn't know that I had before to respond to some kind of disaster. So while I didn't know at the time that so many more disasters would happen in the next 10 years, I did make a decision that now that I have this newfound ability that I didn't know I had, I would use it if ever needed. And then after um, a couple years, the tsunami in Sri Lanka happened. So I decided to go there and basically just helped with uh, orphanages, helped uh, build some houses. It was in Sri Lanka. And then uh, the same year, um, this isn't uh, advancing. Oh, uh, pointed at this. Oh, there we go. I was pointing it at the screen like a dum dum. So, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate the, the. I need all the help I can get. Welcome. So, in uh, a after the the. Uh, after the tsunami, Hurricane Katrina happened, and I ended up going down with um, 26 Zodiac boats, because they needed boats. Uh, New Orleans and the surrounding areas were completely flooded, and uh, brought the boats down so they could rescue people. But after about two weeks uh, of the army rescuing people, the waters had gone down, and I went out into the streets of New Orleans and rescued Kutas and Billies, because I really love Kutas and Billies. In fact, even now, in Islamabad or Karachi or wherever I met, if I see a strayed Kuta or Billy, I will pick them up and take them with me. And my staff can tell you that we have lots of Kutas and Billies at our different <laughs> places because of this. In fact, I was in Karachi and landed yesterday and my staff saw me with a cage in my hands. And it was two kittens that I brought with me from Karachi. I was in Sadr in the bazaar and I saw these two beautiful kittens. So I enlisted the help of five rickshaw drivers and we caught them and I put them in a cage and I got them on the plane and I took them with me and now they're they're uh, now they have all the chicken they can eat forever where before they were just sitting there trying to maybe feel lucky if they got a chicken bone from the bazaar but now they which is one of the things that I have learned in Pakistan in my five years that I learned about Islam, a religion that I really, really love and respect, and one of the best things about it is that I heard story from my staff that our holy prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, had said to a lady who was living her life in a bad with bad behavior that when she knelt down to give a drink of water to a, uh, a starving and thirsty dog, that he, her sins were washed away. I don't know if I'm telling it exactly right, but then I also heard that the Holy Prophet loved cats. And so my love for cats is a lifelong thing, and, and uh, kutas as well, but... <laughs> Mostly cats. I, I have to admit that it's mostly cats. So, uh, for me to, to be in Pakistan uh, and help people and animals as well is what I consider to be a, a blessing. Some people say to me, you're living in Pakistan, it, almost like that's a bad thing. But like I said before, I could live anywhere in the world and I choose to live in Pakistan for five years because... 
I have found the people to be much friendlier than the Western media will tell. I found the people here to be much more intelligent than anyone in the Western media will tell our country and our countrymen. The Pakistan that I have involved have seen and been involved with doesn't look anything like the Pakistan that I've seen in the media in America. So my five years on ground here in Pakistan shouldn't be, in my opinion, just used to help hurting people and hurting animals here and help with the flood victims and help with the earthquake, but also to teach my fellow Americans what they don't know about Pakistan. Because, unfortunately, my fellow Americans hear 2% of the truth about Pakistan 100% of the time. And by hearing 2% of the truth 100% of the time, there's no way that they could get a clear picture. They're saddled with debt. The middle, cl middle class and the poor class in America, they're trying to pay their car payments and their house payments. And they're distracted by that. Maybe in the morning and maybe in the evening they have a little bit of time to watch the news or go on the internet or see the headlines. The headlines are always negative about Pakistan. Unfortunately, they never tell the other 98% that's good about Pakistan. Uh, I'm not sure why they do that, but I have made it a responsibility that I feel like God has given me since I have been on the ground and I have met the Pakistani people in many different scenarios, in small villages, in places that most people tell me not to go, like Swat and Charsada and places I'm working now in flood areas, Peshawar, Balochistan, uh, Shikarpur, these places. And I've never spent even one dime on security. I don't travel with security guards. And yet, here I am five years later, I'm still here. So I think that that is something that would surprise a lot of Americans. In fact, when I do go back to America and talk to Goras, <laughs> I try to tell them, thank you. I try to tell them these things, these realities. I try to teach young people. I spoke at the Air Force Academy and many other colleges, but the Air Force Academy was a special place because I went and I talked to kids that are going to be officers in the military. And I told them all the things that I thought that they should know about Pakistan in this part of the world. And afterwards, they were all coming up to me wanting to volunteer. I showed them the slides uh, that I'll show you in a minute of some of the beautiful children we've served. Try to work on those misconceptions so that maybe in our country, if people like me tell people in America more of the whole truth, because if you have, if I set a puzzle here and I give you two pieces of the puzzle and there's a hundred pieces and I only show you two of them, you're never going to really know what the whole picture is. Yeah. So I'm trying to give Americans the other 98 pieces of the puzzle so that they can not only understand that the Pakistani people are zabardast and khubsarit, but that they can also understand that America, instead of blaming Pakistan for whatever is going on in the world, we need to look in the mirror as Americans. We need to be introspective and see that our leaders' short-sighted decisions after the Afghan war caused a lot of problems here. Problems that Americans don't seem to get in their head that we have such a big responsibility for. For instance, when we left Afghanistan after the Soviets were kicked out and left this area, there was a lot of women and children whose lives were destroyed. There were four million refugees that came to Pakistan and, and, and an already poor country was taxed even more with, with their situation. We, all the extremists that we brought in to fight this war against the Soviets, we didn't debrief those foreign fighters. We didn't de-radicalize them. We didn't take their weapons away. We didn't give them a better choice. We just left them here to be Pakistan's problem. And for those reasons, things got out of control. Now, I, I talk to Pakistanis all the time who tell me, and rightly so, they say to me, well, you know, we also made mistakes and we have internal corruption. We, we should rise above our own selves and we have to take uh, our own future in our own hands, no matter what the United States or anybody else does. And I think that's true, and it's a very healthy attitude to have. However, I'm an American, and I also care about our country atoning for its sins. Because unless 
If you've sinned, if you've made a mistake, you have to atone for it. Our country has made a big sin in this part of the world that we have not yet atoned for. We were able and willing and did in fact rebuild our big enemies of Germany and Japan after World War II. But why couldn't we then rebuild our friends? After all, the United States became the lone superpower out of the deal. The Soviet Union fell apart, humiliated and bankrupt after the Afghan war just a couple years later. So we owed this part of the world the kind of resources that we had at our command for a Marshall Plan. And then all the things that are happening right now, I can tell you, I am sure that they wouldn't be what they are. So we have a big responsibility. And it's very late and a lot of terrible things have happened as a result of this problem. But I think that the young people of America, if they know more about what really has happened here, and not the spin from Fox News, if they know more about what's, and, and not just Fox News, there's many other outlets, and they all have the same kind of uh, story to tell about Pakistan. 200 Pakistani Americans came to Haiti with me earlier this year and worked with me for three months. I left Pakistan, I went to Haiti, I worked there, I was there the day after the earthquake. 200 Pakistani Americans came, and in a news cycle of 24-hour news in America talking about the Haiti earthquake, I met many news people in Haiti that were looking for stories to tell. I told them about 200 Pakistani Americans, Muslims, never were terrorists, never will be terrorists, healers, some of the best and finest people that I've ever met in my life from Pakistan. Even Dr. Saeed Akhtar, Akhtar who's at Shifa Hospital, he came and worked with me. Wonderful people. But do you think that CNN and Fox News did a story, even five minutes about them? Nope. No. But when Faisal Shahzad tries to blow up New Times Square, they put the headline, Made in Pakistan. Well, I wanted the headline also to be made in Pakistan for those 200 Pakistani American doctors. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. So, what I've decided to do is use one of my tools that I started out with in life, and that's music. Through music, I think we can reach American kids and show them through music by entertaining them and showing them some good music to listen to, then telling them the other parts of the story that the media doesn't give them. And I have Chris Martin from Coldplay, I have Guns N' Roses on one side, so we have popular bands and popular singers in the West that can get the attention of the kids. And then on the other side we have Strings, Ustad Fatah Ali Khan, Atif Aslam, Shazad Roy, and I could go down the list, Zeb and Hania. These singers in both America and Pakistan getting together to create great music, inshallah, but also to then show Americans the Pakistan they don't know, the people that they don't know to find some kind of way, since the media isn't doing its job to tell the whole story, and their agenda is one of profit, making a profit, making money, and getting viewers, and showing the train wreck all the time that gets people's attention. So their morals and their agenda is not apparently to tell the whole truth. Well, my agenda is for the whole truth to be told. So my agenda, using music as a tool, inshallah, will be successful with this project, making great music and showing the people of America the Pakistan that they don't get to see. So this is where I ended up. The day that I got back home from working in uh, Hurricane Katrina, I had just come home. My son, who's 20 years old now, he was 15 at the time, and he's been to Pakistan with me, by the way. When I came in, I gave him a big hug. We sat down to a pizza. I turned on the television. I hadn't been in the door for five minutes. Earthquake in Pakistan. So I saw this earthquake, and God put a feeling into my heart, you have to go. So I looked at my son. I said, I'm going to Pakistan. Before I knew how I was getting there, who I was going to go with, before I knew anything, I'd already made the decision. One of my flaws in my character, and there are many, is that I'll make a decision and then later I figure out how I'm going to do it. 
But I made the decision to go. God gave me many faults, but the one thing he gave me that is going to redeem me, hopefully, at the day of judgment, is that I can't stand to see a human being or even a Billy suffer. I have to do something. I can't sleep at night. So I wouldn't have been able to comfortably sleep at night, that night or any other night, if I had turned my back on the, my brothers and sisters in Pakistan suffering. So within a week of leaving Hurricane Katrina, I ended up here in Chikar. That white mountain in the background is the line of control. We now work in 10 health facilities in Azad Kashmir, working with government, helping them with resources that they don't have available in budget so that we make a stronger healthcare system. This is what I've been doing for five years. This is the lake that was created by the earthquake just behind Chikar, where almost a thousand people were killed in three villages just in that one landslide. So this area that I'm working in is very devastated. During the emergency phase, US Chinook helicopters, who did a great job, as they did again in the, uh, in the floods, which I wish the US military would do more of that kind of work. And if we took one month of what it cost to run the war in Afghanistan, 17 billion US dollars, what if we took that, what it costs one month of the war, and what if we gave $17 billion to rebuild the lives of flood-affected and disaster-affected people and poor people in Pakistan? Part of our atonement that I'm talking about, that I think America owes this part of the world for its leaders' stupid mistakes 20, 30 years ago. If we would do that, then we might not have to ever spend another dime in Afghanistan. The kind of things that we send our military to do would be much better serving the world's pur purposes of being a peaceful and just place if we would use those machines of war for this kind of work. There's plenty of work out there to be done. And then maybe we wouldn't have to be fighting wars. So I'm also trying to tell my fellow Americans these kind of messages as well. So anyway, they did a great job. The Pakistan army is unloading the boxes and medicines, and we are with a group of Pakistani American doctors that I came over with, taking in the critically ill, about 50 to 100 patients a day in our little hospital. We would basically patch them up, stabilize the critical, and get them out on these helicopters. So this was a lady who needed, young lady who needed formula for her baby. And now we do primary and emergency health care in the last five years. Like I said, I decided after being there for a few months that I was going to stay. People in the army asked me to stay. People in UNICEF asked me to stay. People in the villages that we served asked me to stay. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, I can go back to my life, a wandering minstrel, minstrel playing music, a very easygoing life, or I could really do something to serve humanity. That's why I decided to stay in Pakistan. I saw it as an opportunity to do something much greater than the self. So my message to all of you, children out there, and kids and young people, and college students, and people who've just started their career, is if I, a guy who was addicted to cocaine when I was your age and doing nothing for humanity, in fact, I'm lucky to be alive. People say to me all the time, aren't you afraid of something happening to you in Pakistan? And I say, no, because I should have been dead 25 years ago of a drug overdose and only God saved me. So what it, if I die tomorrow, I, I still have 25 extra years. So the young people out there, if I have any message for you at all, because you're way at the head of the game. When I was your age, I, wasn't, I didn't have myself together at all. It's serving humanity. Don't be afraid of, the, of danger. Live in a way that you actually can put yourself in danger. Live in a way that you throw your life to a greater cause. Um, that's my advice. And I think that Pakistan needs you. Your, your generation, you can save Pakistan. You can be a part of making this world a better place. And uh, listen to that spirit and that voice inside you that says to do something. Even if you don't know how you're going to do it or in what way you'll do it, make the decision. And I honestly tell you that Allah will open those doors for you 
and help you with that decision that you've made and help make it a reality. These are some of the medical camps we do in remote villages. You can see the, the jeeps uh, are going through the river. So the river and the road are the same. This is my son, Tim. He's 20 years old. He's a political science uh, student. He came to Pakistan and worked with me. And when he took off with me in Karachi back to home in the airplane on the PIA flight, I said to him, so what do you think of Pakistan and Pakistanis? Pakistanis are a bunch of terrorists, huh? He said, no, Dad, they're the strongest people I've ever met. So if I could tell, if I could have my son come over here, and he's a young American kid, grew up, even though I'm not a rich guy, he had everything. He had good food, good nutrition, good health care, good education, because he lives in a country that, that has those things for most of its citizens. If he can come over and feel that way about Pakistan and Pakistanis, then I thought to myself, wow, what if I could have 10 kids his age know the truth? What if I could have 20? What if I could have 20,000? So I'm not going to stop there. Maybe 20 million. Whatever God gives me the ability to do, I am going to do whatever I can with whatever time I have left, whether it's five minutes or 50 years, that the experience my son had will be shown to other kids. Now, when my son was in his political science class, not long after he got back from Pakistan, there was a kid in there. They were talking about Pakistan. There was some political science discussion going on about the world. And some kids said, oh, Pakistan is, you know, double game. They're always playing games. They're lying to the United States and stuff like that. Not to the mention, he, he doesn't seem to know about all the times that America lied to Pakistan. But anyway, he was against Pakistan. So my son said, you know, Pakistanis are not like that. Not all of them. Yeah, there's bad people everywhere in the world, but there's a lot of good Pakistanis. The kid's like, well, how would you know? And he said, well, I just came from Pakistan. <gasps> you know, everybody's like, oh. The point is, though, that after that, he was able to tell kids what he's experienced. And then the teacher invited me to come and speak to the kids. So I came and I showed them these slides of the beautiful children that were serving, the health cares that we're doing, the music that we're playing, uh, some of the Urdu songs that we've learned. The wonderful children of Pakistan. And those 60 kids in that room, you could have heard a pin drop. The teacher afterwards, the professor said to me, wow, I've never had uh, anyone come speak to my class and the children were so attentive. You know, usually they're rolling their eyes or falling, their sleep, uh, falling asleep. I said, the reason is because everything I told them about Pakistan and everything I showed them of Pakistan is the complete opposite of whatever they have been told and shown before. So if I can show those 60 kids and turn their thinking around, I hope, inshallah, I can do it for more. I'll try to wrap up here. This is some of the uh, young men that I've worked with since the earthquake who've helped me win medals like the Tamga Isar. And these were just kids that came from some of these poor villages and I hired them. All of my 70 employees are Pakistani. If foreigners want to come and, and volunteer, fine. They pay their own way and then they come. But as far as creating jobs and as far as having people work with my NGO, I prefer to have local people in the villages. I prefer to spend my money in the villages. I buy my food from the local bazaar in the areas that we work. I don't spend any money on security. I rent local Jeeps. I become an economic benefit to the community as well as a health care benefit to the community. And that way, not only do they love me, but they'll protect me. I don't need a security budget. I don't need to spend money on guns and, and fancy vehicles to keep myself safe. Anyway, these are the children that I've served and many others like them. This is why I'm in Pakistan. They deserve everything that my son has had. They don't deserve anything less than whatever my son has gotten. And I'm going to do everything I can, inshallah, to give it to them. Thank you. In SWAT last year, here's where we were working in Mardan, schools, places where kids uh, and families had to live. Okay, I'm going to end here. I'm just going to show you one thing that's really important. I was told, don't go to this area. Don't go to these people. There's Taliban mixed in there. They'll see you, an American, and for sure they'll kill you. 
or they'll th threaten you. And I said, you know what? There's a nice, beautiful field over there. Just put me in it. If I get killed, just bury me there and, and tell people that I'm, I wouldn't have changed it even a single decision. I'm glad I'm here, and that's the way it is. When I came there to the people, instead of treating me like an enemy, I told them I was American. People said, wear a shower kameez and try to look like a baton. And I said, no, I want them to know when I'm American. I'm going to tell them I'm an American. I'm going to tell them that I'm there to help them. And through an interpreter, because I don't know Pashtun at all, through an interpreter, I told these people where I was from and that I was there to help him. And wouldn't you know it, instead of treating me like an enemy, they embraced me and they let me hold their children. This guy with a beautiful black beard that somebody in America would think is Taliban. They let me hold their baby like I was an uncle in the family. So this is the photo and these are the photos America needs to see. This is in Haiti, where again, 200 Pakistani-American doctors, including Dr. Pervez Akhtar and many others, came and worked with me in a devastated area. These are the floods. I'm going to go through these very quickly because you've seen all the images. I flew in an airplane over Shikarpur in Sakhar uh, three days ago, and it's still got too much water. It's amazing. So this is the work that we're doing in healthcare. We're sponsoring mother and child health facilities in many of the earthquake effect, in, in not only the earthquake affected areas for the last five years, but now in the flood areas. In SWAT, this is Atif Aslam with me, giving out some, some good so we can help inspire young people to help out more. This is Balochistan, where my team is, one, one of the teams. All over Pakistan, in different tent villages and camps and uh, going by boat and plane and train and automobile. Uh, the Maternal Child Health Care Center in Charsada that we're sponsoring with some partners like Hashu Foundation and Shifa Hospital. And there it is, the older generation of Pakistan, the newer generation of Pakistan. My name is Todd Shea. I'm dedicated to them. Thank you very much for your time.